friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. Welcome to part five of the mandolin. And uh, I haven't got to work on the mandolin as much in the last several weeks as I would like to, but uh, I have been working on the back. Uh, you can see I've got some of the back uh, dished out. The, the outside is pretty much finished, except for the rows that I'll carve in later. And uh, the inside is dished pretty good, but we're still quite a ways from having that finalized. What I've been doing, what's keeping me from working on this is, I'm, as I mentioned uh, in earlier videos, I've uh, put a hold on the instruments being shipped in, so you'd think I'd have all kinds of time, wouldn't you? Well, I've spent all my time I, that I've got so far working on different things, uh, including uh, the shop. I've done shelving and storage and, you know, just uh, different things that help improve the shop, because I have not been happy with the shop since I moved in over a year ago. Now that I'm getting the shop up in pretty good shape, uh, it won't be long. I'm going to go ahead and do a shop tour. I've had a number of requests for that. Uh, the big thing that I did in the shop was I installed my dust collection system. And oh my gosh, have I missed that. And that really is a major, major, major improvement in the shop. Oh my gosh. I've got all the uh, all the tools hooked up to the dust collection now and uh, got all the tools pretty much where I want them. Uh, it, in one way it was good because, you know, I kept moving things around till I found where they fit the best and uh, now that I've got them fitting pretty good, uh, I could hook up the dust collection and be fairly confident that I'm not going to have to move it too much. The other thing I wanted to mention in this, uh, before we get into the uh, mandolin uh, part five, is that, uh, you know, I mentioned that I put the instruments on hold being shipped to me. If you want to be put on a waiting list, uh, and I already have quite a few people on the waiting list, uh, send me an email to rosastringworks at gmail.com. And I'll put your email in file with the rest of them. And whenever I decide to start accepting instruments again, I will send an email to each and every person in that folder. So that's the way if uh, you want to be notified as soon as I uh, make up my mind to start accepting instruments again, that's how I will notify you. The other thing is that I still haven't got much time to work on the rental house yet, but I gotta, I'm getting up there pretty soon. Um, I've got some siding still to put on the uh, rental house on the outside. I've got some siding to put on my workshop on the outside. I've been cutting some firewood. I'm, it just, oh, you, you just can't imagine. I, I have not been sitting around twiddling my thumbs, trust me. Plus, I'm still taking walk-ins and things like that here in the shop as far as customers go uh, for local business. But uh, there's not as much local business like that. Uh, uh, it's, it's really, really part-time on that. Let's get back into part five of building this mandolin. We're going to focus mostly on the neck in this video. We're getting ready to start the next phase of this mandolin build, and the next phase is going to be building the neck. Uh, many of you probably know already that I build my necks with a uh, five piece uh, neck down the middle. Uh, I have three laminates in the middle, dark, light, dark, and then I have the curly maple on both sides. I've done it that way since the beginning. I'm not going to change at this point. Uh, if you want to know why I think that's a good method, the reason I think it's a good method is, is two things. Well, actually three things. First of all, it stabilizes the neck. That's why they put plywood on the corners of buildings. It's very stable and it keeps the building from racking. Uh, twisting, moving, that type of thing. So the ply, basically by making this in multiple plies, you're giving that neck that kind of ability and stability. Obviously, then the second part is that that really makes it a very strong neck. But then the third part is that it also uh, makes it decorative. And I've been doing it that way since the beginning, so therefore I'm going to continue doing it that way it's just a trademark, if you will, of the mandolins that I build. So here we go. We're going to take this. And, and, and by the way, a, a side note is that the dark wood that I always put in the necks uh, is always from a tree that I cut down myself. So every mandolin has at least some wood uh, up from a tree that I actually physically cut the tree down. And this is some cherry that I cut down to actually build my first shop. This was a cherry tree that was in the way where I needed to build my first shop. And so I cut it down. I made a lot of furniture out of this cherry tree as well. Drop leaf uh, table to just as one example. 
But uh, anyway, that's what we're using. We're going to use this cherry as the dark wood in the uh, laminate of the neck. So here we go. The three pieces together showing 238 thousandths, uh, 250 thousandths would be a quarter inch. So we're roughly 10, 12 thousandths under that, which is fine. I, you know, I just want a nice, narrow, thin, decorative strip in there. And uh, it'll look good and uh, make the neck real strong and real stable. We got the two pieces made there, the three pieces made here, and if you, whoops, if you put them all together like that, then you kind of roughly see what the neck will look like. It's going to be a look something like that. We've got the block set up here, and uh, we're getting ready to uh, glue these pieces up. Got them in order of the way I want them, and uh, so we'll just glue, put glue here, spread it around, and move them, move to the next one. As I do this, I try to put as thin a glue as I can get on here and still get full coverage. I don't want a ton of extra squeeze out. Um, I know. Uh, you know, there are ways to keep these things from sliding around. Um, the way I do it for the most part is just barely make it, you know, just barely have the glue on there and it makes it tacky really fast and they don't slide around as much. You could use salt, I know that, um, but I just don't do that. I, I'm afraid the salt would weaken the joint a little bit. And I'm all about strength on things like this. So I don't want to deal with the salt. I'm not saying it will, but I, I think it potentially could. The uh, top of the neck is going to be down, and I'm purposely putting that down so I can line the boards up good and flat. You could probably get away with only putting glue on one side, but that's not how I roll. I like to make sure there's really good glue coverage. I know from lots of experience that good coverage and good clamping is the secret to good holding. It was actually less work to make this out of a single piece than it is to do it this way. I know that. It's just not how I do it. I decided to move the neck in here to this vise, which is the way I normally glue up necks. This vise has two rails right here, and you can set them down on there and get everything good and flat on the edge. 
crank it down really tight and then I put extra clamps on both ends which you can barely see in the video I realize but anyway it's clamped in there really good and tight and uh, I'm just gonna let that set overnight it's been several days since I glued up this blank for this neck and uh, you can see there's glue squeeze out the boards moved a little bit they're not perfectly flat that's okay it really doesn't matter at this point there's a little bit of roughness on the edges what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, this edge here is pretty clean and I'm going to use this edge to uh, be my square flat edge to put up against the jointer to flatten this off because I want this and this perfectly square so I'm just going to lightly touch this on the sander that's real good that's plenty good enough I, I just wanted one side good and clean and smooth that I can put against the uh, fence on the joiner to square up this side. Well, as usual, I forgot to turn the camera on, so again, we're going to have to fire the camera crew. But uh, all I did was I just laid this across here and squared up this bottom. So now this and this are theoretically real square. They look real square based on just looking at it, so I think we're in good shape. I will double check it with a square just to make sure that it's good. I did just check to make sure it's perfectly square. I think you can see that it is. Um, it's, and that's another way you can tell it's perfectly square if you can go from one side to the other. So it's absolutely perfect. I see no light at all. So I'm real happy with that. And now we're going to trace our profile on here and cut that out. I was thinking about squaring up this end, but there's no point in it anyway because when I cut this off, it's going to get rid of that end anyway. So I'm not worried about that. So I got my pattern lined up on here and basically on this pattern because it's just a handmade pattern it's not perfect all I really do is trace uh, on these square things I just trace the corners and then I use straight lines to to make them better then I just take a straight edge and connect all the straight lines just because the patterns a little on the rough side it's a good pattern it's just that is the straight lines aren't perfect and all that so might as well just make them perfect with a straight edge now we'll go to the band saw and we'll saw that out It's just my luck. Nobody uses doorstops anymore. I could have probably gotten rich off of designer doorstops over the last 30 years. <clears throat> off camera, I've done some setup. I've got my blade adjusted to exactly 5 eighths of an inch. I ran a test piece through there and checked the depth and it's exactly 5 eighths. Um, this wood is oh a little more than that. I mean the wood's about 3 quarters of an inch thick right in here. I've got a 3 16 inch thick plate or a strip of wood glued right on the on the nut end here and that'll help me cut a taper then so that at the deepest end will be 5 8 7 inch thick and at this end will be 3 16 less than that. I've already adjusted the fence so that I'm cutting right down the middle of this uh, right down the middle of this white strip which is dead center of the neck and uh, we'll just cut that first and see how that goes. So it's going to get noisy. Here we turn on the dust collection and we turn on the saw. The next step in the process that I'm taking is just to smooth this out, get it good and flat. There's a few saw marks on here. Uh, this would be the flat upper part of the peg head. And we're just going to lightly sand it.
Next, I'm going to make the wings for putting on the sides of the peg head. Uh, what I'm referring to is widening out the peg head here. Now that we've got the slot cut and all that stuff, so these wings will go on here to make the peg head wider so that we can cut out that fancy peg head. And what I did was I just took the off cut from the bottom of the neck and uh, I split it down the middle. And now I need a piece that's about uh, three quarters of an inch wide on each side to uh, make this. I'm actually going to make it about an inch wide. It really doesn't hurt to have it a little wider. Okay, I've just got a dry fit up here to make sure the wings are going to fit on here correctly. Um, I'll just make a point here of showing you something. It depends on how things work out. It, it, I, I'm going to be honest, I, you know, the strip that I first cut for this side wasn't quite wide enough. And it really just depends on how wide this piece is here and what you got left over. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. But anyway, the bottom line is it wasn't wide enough. So I had to make a wider piece here on this side. Made it out of the same board and got it curly and everything. So it looks good. It's going to match real nice. But anyway, uh, we're going to glue this on here, and this side here just sticks out further because of that, the way that it's shaped on that lower. And uh, so we're ready to put the glue on here now and then turn it over and stick it in the vise. Uh, the reason I turn it over is because these metal bars here keep it good and flat. I made a pencil mark across there so I wouldn't screw this up <coughs> while I had it together with the pattern on there so that I wouldn't turn it upside down or over when I got it in the vise here. We'll just let that sit for a couple hours and then we'll move on to the next step. I've penciled on here the lines that I want to cut to start forming this neck. I'm not worried about the peg head yet. I don't have the peg head overlay. I've got that on order, so I don't want to do anything up here yet. But I just want to cut out a rough outline of this neck so that I can start shaping the neck to the final shape here on the back side. Before I do that, though, I want to get this flat. And the only reason I want to get that flat is so that this and this are equal. And when I'm cutting this out, it'll be square. It's not even that big a deal. It's just a personal preference. So here we go. We're going to try to run it through the sander and get this a little bit flat. Whoops. Turn on the dust collector. That'll be good enough for now. It's not to the final thickness, but that's okay. At least it's smooth. It'll be square, so now I can cut this out on the bandsaw. we're going to call that good for right now. I left plenty of meat. I left just a hair of the pencil line everywhere and I already double checked my measurements on the lower and as long as I left part of the pencil line then I'm outside of what I need so I'm good there. So uh, we're just going to clamp this up in the vise and we're going to start shaping this neck. Got a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, I do need, before I can start shaping this, I do want to cut this uh, angle in here. Um, I don't dovetail mine. I do it like the Simonoff book at the begin, uh, in his first book, and that is um, I like to dowel pin it. And I really think that's the strongest joint you'll ever make. I don't see how you could do it any better. So I like that joint. Obviously, I know how to cut a dovetail. Obviously, I can cut a dovetail, but I prefer this uh, joint. I think it's a better joint, so that's what I'm going to do. And so, anyway, I have to cut some of this off first. And uh, so, uh, if I 
you know, it's hard to do this because you can't see the line you're trying to cut. So what I'm doing is I'm watching down here at the bottom and I'm making sure I don't cut into this edge right here because this edge is already where I want it. And I just watch this top line then and the bottom so that I, that I don't cut. So I'm going to leave plenty on here and that's okay. Okay, now the same logic applies. I can knock off a lot of this with the saw as long as I don't touch this down here. Well, if I was brave, I could take off some more, but uh, there's no point in going crazy here. I can, I can take it off pretty fast and pretty easily with a rasp, so that's how I do it. A lot of guys would use, you know, other means to do this, but I just use a coarse rasp. It really knocks the wood off in a hurry. That's not too bad for just a few minutes worth of work, and uh, we we got quite a ways to go yet. I'll get up my dimensions and things and start figuring it out exactly how I want to carve it. Now that I have the neck sufficiently round, it fits in my jig here, or fixture, to hold the neck so that I can saw closer up here. I'm, I, again, I'm not worried about the pig head so much, but I just want to get as much of the neck sawed out up here as I can so I can do the shaping. That'll make it a little easier to do the carving up into this area here. Got the little plane all sharpened up real good and we're going to hollow it out. We're getting pretty close on the mandolin back, so I'm smoothing out the outside of the back now, uh, calling this the final shape. I've taken more off of it, but uh, we're getting so close now that uh, I have to get it down to its final shape so I can really work on those specific dimensions.